Hello, and welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lowe. Too many young dentists have no training and no clue how to run a small business. It's no fault of their own. It's not like there was time in dental school for schools to be able to teach them all that. But now they're at the point where they feel like they want to own their own practice at some point in the future, and they don't know how to get there. This podcast is my own personal journey to learn the answers to these questions of how can I get to the point where I'm ready to own my own dental practice? And then once I'm in that practice, what am I going to do? So this is episode one of season one, and we're breaking this podcast into seasons, chronological seasons that go through the steps of preparing for, acquiring, and then running a, a dental practice. For me, I don't have all this knowledge. I don't know how to do all these things. And I figured there has to be other people in this same camp. Um, I I recently graduated in 2015 from Midwestern University in Phoenix. And I'm now practicing for the U.S. Army at Fort Hood, Texas. And and I'm doing a a two-year AEGD residency here. One of my fears when I joined the Army was that by the time I got out of the Army in six years after my residency and paying back my commitment, that... I would be behind my classmates in terms of practice management knowledge and how to run a business, how to deal with insurance, um, competing in in that world, and that I would lack uh, a significant chunk of knowledge. It turns out, as I've talked with other classmates of mine, that even if you're in a private practice office, you're not necessarily learning how to run a private practice. You're in the back doing dentistry in your chair and sure they give you patience, but that knowledge isn't automatically transferred. And so even though I felt like, oh, I'm in the army, I don't have any exposure to any of these things. Others who are in private practice still don't feel like they know how to run a small business. So if you're in that camp, if you feel like you want to someday own your own practice, but you don't know when, you don't know how, you don't know if you're ready. This podcast is for you, and and we've actually created a roadmap of the seasons that we're going to go through and the steps for you to take to understand how to run a business and how to get there. For me, this was a framework and a context that I could fit all of my knowledge in. If you want this roadmap, go to sharedpractices.com, and it's right there on the front page. There's a little button that says Get the Roadmap. And at this point, I would love feedback. If there's something that you want us to dive into, there's something you don't understand, please reach out to me. Uh, my, my email is richard at sharedpractices.com. If you go to our Facebook page, you can send us a message through Facebook. We, we want to tailor this to your needs and the things that you want to know. Lastly, a huge thanks to Q Optics, who has sponsored us for season one of this podcast. If you see on the, the cover of the podcast, I'm wearing their their new set of loops, and what's unique about their new loops is that they combine the best of ergonomics and magnification. So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the break and how you can save $100 on, on a pair of their loops or $300 on a pair of loops and light together. In today's episode, we have with us Dr. Scott Luna, and in this interview, we're going to talk with him about his recommendations for a new graduate and what they should do to prepare for a startup or a practice ownership. Dr. Luna has multiple times over done startups, built up multi-practice groups, and then and then sold those off. And he actually teaches a, a business course down in San Antonio called Breakaway Practice Seminars for those who want to learn all aspects of startups and running a dental practice and then turn around and do it for themselves as well as a couple other layers of his business. So he'll he'll get to that. More than anything, we are super grateful that we had Dr. Luna on the show. He has such a wealth of knowledge. He's a very busy guy. And it was very gracious of him to take the time to, to share some insight and some wisdom with us. Welcome to the Shared Practices podcast. We have the great honor and privilege of interviewing Dr. Luna today. Dr. Luna started off uh, at the UT Health Sciences School of Dentistry in 2005. From there, you started up three practices in San Antonio, grew to a huge staff, 10 dentists. And then um, was, is that one of the ones that you sold off or, or where did that go from there? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I started. Well, I started one practice right out of school, and it and it grew uh, so quickly. And I ended up hiring associate dentists and opened two more locations. That within four years or so after graduating, um, we had sold those three practices uh, to Heartland. Okay. Uh, and from there, um, about a year later, I, I think it was, we opened seven practices in a, an entirely different city. Okay, that was up in Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah, that's correct. We opened those seven and um, had those for a handful of years, and then I sold those seven to a local dentist there in Dallas. Nice. Okay. And what you are typically known for is for your breakaway practices seminars, which you documented your whole startup process and all of your experiences going through this you know, starting a new practice, doing it in a, in a much more intelligent way, shared that on Dentaltown, got feedback, reiterated on that process, and eventually developed the, these series of seminars that you give down in San Antonio um, under the, the Breakaway Practices Seminars. Is that correct? Yeah, that's how it started. But, um, you know, the seminar used to be about the few lessons that we had learned in building these practices and getting hundreds of new patients a month. And, you know, how do you handle that? How do you grow that? But they've really they've really transitioned to a much bigger, deeper level now um, because we've got more data. We've got more experience. We we help manage about 300 practices right now. We do marketing, we answer their phones, we clean up their billing, we find new locations. We've, we've helped build about 80 startup practices now for new dentists and for mature dentists. And, and all of that and all of those things that we've done, um, we've been able to kind of repeat success and get a track record. And those lessons learned have now formed the basis for what we teach in our two-day seminars. Which is incredible because very few people have that sort of perspective of we've done this, we've done it again, we've done it again and again and again, mined the data multiple times, tweaked and, and seen what's worked, A, B tested. So it's, it's amazing the, that level of knowledge that you both have and provide through those courses. And, and I would recommend to people if you want to know kind of more about all of the different services, because that's kind of just the, the entry level of, of what you guys offer. I know you have Breakaway Affiliates, is a, and I don't want to butcher this, but it seems to be a process of helping someone through not only taking these classes, but then through the first three to five years of starting and running a practice and having a lot more guidance and services and support all along the way. Uh, so you're not on your own just figuring this out. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, you could really, uh, I, I know this this podcast isn't about my company, but I mean, it's important to understand what we do in our experiences so that, that people can know whether or not they should, I guess, believe what we're saying, right? Right. Um, yeah, so part of, so the, the lightest way people interact with our company is they go to our seminars and they go through this two-day intense, like, dental business boot camp. Right. Uh, they have it for we, we we do it for startup dentists or we do it for existing practices or we do it for dentists that want multiple locations. Um, that's kind of level one. Level two of dentists interacting with us is having us um, help clean up and manage their accounts receivables and do their marketing and do their phones and do their IT and basically do a lot of work from afar that typically they would have some of their staff do. That's kind of the second layer of things we do, and it's very effective for us to do that. The third layer is what you alluded to, where a dentist wants to build a practice. They want help in finding an ideal location and designing it properly and managing the construction and setting up the software, marketing it, getting patients coming in, managing the staff. You know, and we that is our consulting program that you that's called the affiliate program. Okay. And it's a, it's a four-year program. And then we've got the deepest way um, people interact with us, and that is where they are actually partners of ours, and we help fund their practice or practices, multiple practices. We uh, do all the business things, the HR, the legal, the accounting, the financial metrics tracking, as well as the AR and marketing and all those types of things in partnership with a dentist, and, and that dentist does all of the clinical activities and manages the clinical teams 
and manages the patient base. Um, and so that's kind of the deepest layer to our company. Okay, so you've got the full spectrum of however much help you want, we can provide you with that, um, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you. Uh, you've gone through this incredible journey of, of developing these systems, and that's the theme of, of my podcast. We, originally, we were going to call it the Dental Systems Academy uh, before we settled on shared practices. And I'm kind of on, on the exact other end of, of that journey where I just graduated dental school a year ago. I'm currently in an associateship type position, but with the Army, and I've got five years left in the Army. So I, I know very little compared to, to a practice owner. But my goal is to get guests on the show who understand systems and have developed and refined systems over time that can share those with me and then w with our guests or with our, our audience. And what I don't want to do is I don't want you to share your breakaway method and systems because, first off, it would take too long. I mean, you've got 500, 700 pages. I don't know how much material you've got of just systems and content and we just, you know, can't cover that in a, in a podcasting type format. And the other thing is that's your content that you've earned and learned through painful trial and error. I think in, in David Maloli's podcast, you talk about some of the, the painful mistakes that end up being, you know, million dollar plus mistakes uh, that you then learn from and, and are able to improve upon. And, and our, any of our listeners can come down and take your course in San Antonio. So if you are a listener who's interested in, in Dr. Luna and his courses, um, please, please, please go down to San Antonio and take his courses. There are two things that I would like you to dive deep into on, on this episode with us today. And the first is, after listening to episode 175 of Howard Ferran's podcast, um, you kind of talked about the golden age of the solo doc maybe was 10 to 15 years ago and the golden age of multi-practices being bought up is right now. And there's a lot of pressures coming down from corporate dentistry um, in terms of their purchasing powers, in, in terms of being able to turn around and sell your practice at the end of your career. It's not going to be worth what you think it might be worth um, if you're assuming our previous model of, of buying and selling dental practices. And someone could get the sense that like, Ugh, is it even worth it to own a dental practice? And so I want you to speak to my generation of new grads about practice ownership. Is it still worth it in today's climate? And what are keeping? What are some things that are keeping my generation from practice ownership? And what's your perspective on those things? Yeah, you know, is it worth it? Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. You know, I think a lot of young dentists they're trying to just pay their bills. Um, and if, if that's the goal, let's just get my student loans paid as quickly as possible in a stable environment and be safe, then owning a practice is not going to be the best solution for, for everyone. Okay. Right? Um, but, you know, if the goal is, is to grow wealth, if the goal is to have a higher income tomorrow instead of right this second, then I think most people in the industry would argue that owning the practice is the best way to do it. But there's some assumptions there. There's the assumption that if you own the practice, you will also learn what you have to learn to make that a successful practice. If you own the practice, you will have enough working capital from your loan to hold you over so that you can pay your student loans and right. your other expenses while that practice grows. Um, and I've seen time and time again, dentists who, who did decently well in an associateship uh, really struggle owning their practice. And I've seen the opposite, dentists coming right out of school, going into a crappy associateship and knowing that they're more driven than that and that they can do better than that. And they really want to be on their own and control their destiny a little more and they go out and learn what they have to learn and build a practice and do extremely well. Um, you know, the average dentist might earn uh, somewhere between one hundred and one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year take home pay. OK, um, yet when you when and that that would be typical of an associate dentist. Uh, sure. 
when you look at owner dentists, um, the average startup practice in this country, the dentist loses five thousand dollars that year. Ugh. They don't make anything; they lose money. That's painful. Um, but you know, when you look at our average startup practice, it's completely different. They've made hundreds of thousands of dollars that first year. So you know, it, it's easy for people out there to make these big statements, these big assumptions, saying, "Oh no." You need to go work as an associate for two or three years. Get your get your speed up, learn dentistry, and get some secure income under your belt. And then you need to go own a practice. Well, I could see where the line of thinking is for that. But I'll tell you, I was driven right out of school, and I know a lot of dentists are driven right out of school. And we need to drive right into practice ownership typically, whereas other dentists aren't. Other dentists are not focused on that. They, they really look at themselves as just wanting a, a decent job. And those dentists that want a decent job probably aren't ready for the trials and tribulations of practice ownership. Okay. And they probably are not in the mindset to go build a wildly successful lucrative practice. And so they might be best off just working for someone. Um, so I, I think it depends on the dentist. Both options are good. But they may, they're just not good for you, right? Only one is probably the best for you. Um, but that's what I would, I would think about. I, I think it's sad, actually, that a lot of new grads today are focused on just getting a job. I think that's sad. I think it's a result of the debt levels right now. I think it's a result of the lack of information. And almost this groupthink mentality that sometimes happens where, well, what are you doing, classmate? Well, what are you doing? Well, right. professor, what should we do? And everyone says, well, the safe thing's to go get a job, right? Right. Um, I think that's unfortunate um, because I don't necessarily think it's the right thing for everyone to do. Well, and uh, I'm going to jump in here and see what your opinion on this is. Um, a lot of the graduating dentists right now have the option of doing these income-based repayment plans where their student loan payments are a fraction, 10 or 15 percent of their current income. And in my mind, if you're on one of these payment plans, that's like the perfect scenario for doing either an acquisition or a startup or moving into practice ownership of some kind. Because yes, you have these big student loans, but you have permission to like hit the pause button on the obligation and the weight of those student loans if you make less money that year. Um, and so I think the the numbers of the overall debt are what intimidates people rather than the reality of, okay, I can actually be really flexible with these loans, make smaller payments now, knowing that I'm moving into an ownership situation where I can pay down aggressively later. Would you agree with that, or how have you seen people handle their student loans who are moving into ownership? No, there, there's there's lots of flexibility like what you described. Um, I'll tell you the easiest way to deal with student loans is make a lot of money. <laughs> okay, right? yeah. So, um, and, and making a lot of money is not easy. Um, I, but I do think that if, if a dentist is really driven to, and they know they're productive, not, not fast, but they, patients say yes to them and they are in the mindset and they're ready to kind of take this on and take responsibility and do something more than just work for someone that I think they can make a lot of great money and still have the flexibility of how, you know, their, their, their payment plan or, or what they're paying every month for their loans. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I think that if most students and new dentists had the information on how to be successful, then I think more of them would try to go into practice ownership earlier. Absolutely. But, you know, we get out of dental school and no one really sat down and said, hey, based on testing all these patients, we know that if you present treatment in this order or in this way or say these types of things, that your case acceptance will go up. You know, no one got that lecture in dental school. Right. No one got a split testing marketing management lecture or, right. or how do you truly, um, you know, how do you fill your schedule with overdue hygiene patients? What is the script you use on the phone? No one got that lecture. 
So we're all feeling like we're in the dark. And when we're in the dark, we just look for just some glimpse of light. And that's a job working for someone. Up next, a word from our sponsor, Q Optics. I love Q Optics loops to the point where I reached out to them and asked them if they wanted to sponsor season one of my podcast. The first time I put on their loops, I thought to myself, why can't everyone do this? Why can't everyone nail my angle of declination that I want? And the only reservation I had about Q-Optics was that their magnification couldn't go high enough for what I wanted. Well, I am proud to announce that Q-Optics, as of this summer, August 2016, now offers an expanded line of their prismatic loops. So you can go all the way from 2.5 to 3 to 3.5, 4, all the way up to 4.5 in their same frame that everyone loves. This is awesome because... Every other loops company that I've used in the past has always said, oh, well, yeah, we can do 4 or 4.5, but not in that frame. We, we have to go up to this other frame that isn't as ergonomic and we can't push the angle of declination. And after three weeks of using it, my neck's hurting. I'm like, what's the point of using loops if my neck hurts? And I love more magnification. I love being able to see that big cartoon tooth of 4.5x and just know that my margin is is, is money because I can feel and see it. Oh, and did I mention? They're through the lens. This is no flip down, flip up, whatever you want to call it. These bad boys aren't going anywhere. If you want to take a look at how they look and the quality of the build, just check out the cover of this podcast. I'm wearing them in the cover of this podcast. That's how much I love these loops. If you are ready to upgrade both your magnification and your ergonomics, you can email sales at q-optics.com with the promo code SP16 for $100 off of the loops alone or $300 off a loop and light combo for our podcast listeners only. That's SP as in shared practices 16 to sales at qoptics.com. It's time to have the best of both worlds. So for someone graduating from dental school, they are looking to move towards practice ownership. What are some specific things that you would have them do to prepare for practice ownership? So financially, what is, in terms of savings, like liquidity, um, credit scores, uh, anything else, what what does someone need to do to be prepared for practice ownership, if at all? Or or, or should they just go start looking for a practice and, and looking for a bank to loan them money? Well, right out of school, it's it's extremely difficult to get funding. Okay. Um, and if you do get funding, you might get three hundred thousand dollars or so to do a startup, for example, which uh, most of us need a half a million dollars to do a startup. So, you know, it's very difficult. It's extremely challenging. And in dental school, you don't really have a lot of flexibility. You don't have you don't have the ability to go earn twice as much in dental school, right? You right. don't have the ability to cut your expenses way down because you're already way down. So it's tough to prepare financially while you're in dental school. Um, Although if you do make poor decisions, if you make financial commitments, um, that will affect your ability to get funding for years after, after school. Um, So, you know, you, you don't go buy a house, you don't go have a new car, you don't go do all the things you know you really want. So one of the reasons why you went to dental school, you don't do that too early. If you do it in the wrong order, you'll never have a practice. So would you say that as an associate or someone searching for a practice, you should almost never buy a house before buying a practice? Uh, and and uh, not, yeah. and I didn't say always, but almost never, you know, kind of in general. Well, why, why don't I tell you what I think helps to enable you to buy a practice and, and whether or not you buy a house, you can determine, you know, knowing the, the, the information, um, the things that get dentists qualified for loans to buy practices are, um, first of all, having good income and good production in their current job. Okay. That's a big one. Um, second of all, having a healthy credit score. So going going back to the production, what would be a healthy goal? You know, you know, obviously, if you're producing a hundred thousand a month, that would be great. But that's not always reasonable given the associateship or the the dentist 
producing? What's a healthy goal that would allow you to then turn around and get financing more than likely? I think it's going to be up to the bank. Okay. Um, everyone's situation is different, but realize the more you make, the easier it is, or the more you're making up for something you're weak at. They're, they're all weighted, right? Okay. So there's not like a baseline level, get beyond this line. No, it, it's all weighted against each other. Um, the less debt you have, the less pressure there is to earn as much right out of school for a bank. Or the, 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 the worse your credit score is, the more pressure there's going to be for you to be a high-producing dentist, right? Right. So it's credit score, it's, um, it's uh, production and income from your job, it's also debt, current debt load, as well as monthly expenses. Um, those are all very important um, when, you, when you look at getting financing. And some banks also value your experience level, your time. Um, so are you, have you been a dentist six months or three years? They care. Okay. And, um, and most banks that, that value time do give you credit if you're a resident. They do give you credit for that year in residency. Okay. Um, so those are some specific factors. And then, you know, having a liability of a home would affect both your monthly expenses and your overall debt load. And so that can factor into the decision. So Yeah. And also, once you buy a home, you, you have a specific commitment location-wise. Hmm. And you might not find a practice you want or find a great location to do a startup. So I, I think flexibility, minimizing debt, minimizing monthly expenses, and staying as flexible as possible, I think it's very important if you're ultimately wanting to own a practice. Okay. And then um, and how much time do you have? I know, I know we're running close to an hour here, and I'm sure you've got things to, things to do here. Yeah, let me, let me say one more thing about that. Sure. So, what I've just described to you are the traditional rules, um, but you know, an example of non-traditional would be the fact that you know, here at Breakaway, if we have a dentist and we have a dentist that we believe in, and we have a location that we've measured scientifically to be um, a good location, we fund that dentist. Huh. We're not, we're not going to a bank. Um, we're you know, we're, we're funding the dentist. And so all these things I just mentioned, we're going to care about as well, but, but we can override any one of those because it's our own, it's our own deal. You're right? the underwriters. So you can choose what you do and don't fund. That's right. And, um, and you know, a dentist that isn't ideal on paper, um, might be able to have a cosign that, that makes the deal happen with a traditional bank or may choose to buy into a practice right off the bat and have the loan payments uh, be made out of their income and the note be held by the seller. You know, there's a lot of different options out there. So we shouldn't have the assumption that because we don't have stellar credit or because we have a lot of debt um, or because we're not currently producing a lot, we won't be able to own. Um, the traditional model of getting 100% approval for yourself to go own something 100% yourself says, yes, you need experience and income and minimal debt and, and good credit and those types of things. But when you start going into the non-traditional side, there's more options. Right. No, absolutely. Um, and that's that's pretty awesome that you guys have that ability and you've got that liquidity that you can fund dentists that you believe in and in locations that you believe in. So I, I didn't even know that that possibility existed. Um, in terms of, I know you... you attract a lot of people who are looking to do a startup. And I'm sure all of that information would also apply to an acquisition. But what would be some red flags if someone is looking at buying an, uh, an acquisition, buying an existing practice? What are some red flags that you've seen where if a dentist knew this before walking into that practice, they would have avoided a lot of pain and, and heartache buying a practice they shouldn't have bought? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's tough because some of the red flags are, are obvious um, and some red flags aren't necessarily bad if you know how to solve them ahead of time, right? Okay. So, so having a practice that does absolutely horrible marketing, for example, 
uh, that's a red flag you need to be aware of so you don't keep doing that. But that might be a great thing for you to know and find out if you know how to do great marketing. That's a potential opportunity. Yeah, but, but back to your question, the red flags. I think going into a practice where, uh, first of all, where the financial reports are a mess and after an audit by a professional, there's no rhyme or reason and they can't confidently say that this is actually what happens. Well, that's a big red flag, right? Okay. And another red flag would be a dentist who has high production and very low patient flow that wants to just sell out um, to a young dentist who maybe can't produce like that uh, on that low patient flow. You see young dentists diving into a, I mean, the extreme would be a dentist that's been there for 30 years and everyone knows him and loves him and he does $30,000 cases all day, right? Right. A young dentist can't go repeat that. No. So um, if, a, if a young dentist doesn't know that, if they don't realize that truthfully to themselves, then they might be in a, in a real bind when they take that practice over. Um, another red flag is a, a seller dentist that wants to stay on, yet the practice doesn't have the profitability or the patient flow to support that. Um, I, I think some buying dentists look at a seller dentist staying on as a potential uh, benefit, like a safety net, like, okay, someone's going to be there to help me, right. and the patients will see him. But also realize that that seller is eating away patient base. It's taking up income away from the owner and is also a barrier to change. So um, it's not necessarily always a good thing to have the seller stay on if the practice can't isn't set up properly for that. Um, you know, I also think it's a red flag to buy a practice that's just plain not profitable. I think a lot of dentists say, oh, let me buy this practice. It's doing, you know, 300,000 in collections per year. I think I could really improve this thing. Well, they get in and they might not make any money. And they might be in an area that is not growing well, um, a demographics that does not support a really successful practice. And so they end up buying um, a liability and banking on the fact that they can turn it around and they've never ever done that before, right? Right. So, so I would want to buy the most profitable practice I could find that I feel is got audited financials that are clean, that's got healthy patient flow, and I can repeat the success of that practice. I wouldn't want to go into a fixer upper, um, if I've, especially if I've never fixed something up. Uh, so I think that's a red flag as well. Uh, but there's pressure to take the fixer upper because there's not a lot of great practices for sale. Right. So, you know, we look at the fixer upper saying, oh, you know, it's not that much risk. It's only $200,000 to buy it. And I really want to own a practice and I'm ready. And this is what's for sale in the area where I want to live. So let me buy it. Well, I've seen firsthand that dentists go from having a job that pays them decent to owning a fixer upper, upper that makes them go bankrupt. So, um, well, and the, the seller probably didn't have a practice loan that they were paying on when they had that, that 200,000 or 300,000 in collections. And so maybe they were taking home some money, but now that you add a practice loan on top of that, that can disappear pretty quick, I imagine. And then if you lose patients and have staff issues, it, it could all go south pretty quick. That's, that's correct, but it shouldn't scare people. So, so that's the thing, you know, this sounds all scary, Maybe I should just stay in my job and, and, and just take this take home this paycheck, right? Um, it shouldn't scare people if they learn the right information. Right. Um, you know, I could scan a practice using our metrics tracking platform, and I can highlight immediately the things that are wrong with it. And I know based on using our own outsourcing um, division, our outsourcing services, I know what to expect. So if I see a practice has high AR on insurance, I know just by turning on our own outsourcing platform that the AR is going to go down to 62%. You're going to clean that up right away. So, so there's a lot of the unknowns are taken away. It's, it's, it's a calculated decision to buy this practice. It's not like a shot in the dark. I hope I can turn it around. You know? So we shouldn't be scared of it. We should just understand the truth behind it. Okay. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. 
this this has been really good. Is there any other advice that you would give to someone looking to move into practice ownership that's either intimidated or worried or, you know, just needs a, a plan to move towards practice ownership other than come take breakaway because that is obvious. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of people that tell young dentists what to do. And and it's frustrating, too, because they always start out saying, well, and I realize you're a new grad, right? Right. They always, like label a dentist as a new grad. And then all of a sudden they have all this advice that this canned advice they give. And a lot of that advice sounds safe. It sounds normal. Like, yes, I should do that. I should do a GPR and then I should be an associate. And then, you know, I, I should follow this path. It sounds normal. Um, and I'm not saying that's a bad path, but the majority of dentists, in my opinion, aren't highly experienced. They haven't walked down that path a hundred times. They haven't owned a hundred practices. They haven't managed a hundred different teams, right? Right. So the advice that they're giving, they have the best intentions with, but it's based on their anecdotal experience. It's not evidence-based advice, right? Their advice would never hold up in a peer-reviewed journal, right? Right. So um, we wouldn't go choose our own cancer therapy based on someone's opinion. We choose it based on proven proven studies. And uh, the same goes for this. So I encourage Dennis to go seek out other people, other dentists, other institutions, other programs that mimic the path that they want to take. And they mimic it based on volume, on, on evidence, on research. I'm not talking about finding the most successful dentist in town who's got an amazing personality. I'm talking about finding the companies and, and the dentists that have done this over and over and over again and learn from them. And it's hard because everyone else that talks to this dentist, this new dentist, will tell them to many times do the opposite of what the small group of, of repeatable success dentists are actually doing. Um, so it's tough. We have to kind of block out anyone that is not actually following the path we want to follow, and they've done it multiple times. We, we have to block them out. We, we, we have to respect, respect their advice. We might listen to it, but... By no means is that the way it's always done. We should always look uh, to prove that what they said is actually true. Um, I believe that that's how our industry as a whole has been stuck doing the most inefficient things possible. Um, if we were the restaurant industry and we were running a restaurant like we run a dental practice, we'd go bankrupt very quickly. Right. You know, so we got to go figure out you know, who's doing what we want to do and they've done it multiple times so we can actually trust their advice and their experiences. That might be clinically, that might be on the business side, it might be finding high producing associates because you want to be a high producing associate. It might be finding dentists that have done a bunch of startups. You know, it might be finding someone that just does full mouth rehabs all the time in a huge volume and you want to learn how to do full mouth rehab. It goes for everything. Be, be very selective in the advice you actually act on. Well, that, that wraps it all up perfectly. And I, I would invite our listeners that if you find someone that is exactly who this person that, that Dr. Luna has been talking about, that has volume experience, is doing the pathway that you want, and you think that other people would benefit hearing from them, please get a hold of me. And we would love to interview them for the show because these are the, the kinds of experts that we want on our show guiding and giving options. You know, it's there's no one solution fits all. There's no one practice model or one system that everyone has to or should be using. And the more we're exposed to these experts who have expertise from volume of practice after practice after practice, seeing how this works and doesn't work, the better off we're going to be. So thank you so much, Dr. Luna, for your time and for being willing to, to share all of all of this knowledge with us today. My pleasure. Just uh, let me know if, if uh, there's any questions or you need any more help or any, any more podcasts. We're, we're always here trying to help everyone. Um, I, I, just, I just think that as an industry, we all need to come together and, 
and and help each other instead of picking sides of arguments. Right. Uh, so let us know here at Breakaway if anyone has questions or needs help. We'd be glad to help. Thank you, Dr. Luna. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care. That was awesome. Uh, hopefully there's someone still here listening. This is like season four of, of Arrested Development when they realized they didn't have to control the length of their episodes because it was going straight to Netflix. So who cares? Uh, huge thanks to New Villager for letting me use the song Black Rain as my intro and outro music. And a huge thank you to both Dr. Alan Mead and Dr. Mark Costas for having me on the Dental Hacks podcast and Dentalpreneur respectively this last Friday to, to announce this show. Uh, meant, meant a ton to me that you guys would do that. So thank you for listening. Subscribe, leave us a review on iTunes, share this with your friends. And then lastly, I wanted to dedicate this, this episode to a friend of mine um, who passed away last week, Dr. Blake Osborne. Two things I loved about Blake. Uh, Blake had this distinct um, gravelly voice. And no matter what kind of day you were having, you just talk with Blake for a few minutes and, and you were always smiling. He had an infectious smile and positive personality. Uh, from his Facebook page, he, he had some favorite quotes. And I don't know if this is something he just put on there when he was 18 and didn't really mean much to him or, or if it was something that he really he really appreciated. But one of the quotes is from Leonardo da Vinci, and it says, When once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward. For there you have been, and there you will always long to return. Blake, our eyes are now turned skyward. We're going to miss you.